third of Galatians, like we've mentioned, is Paul uh, defending his apostleship, uh, defending that he is a genuine apostle. And who is he defending himself against? The Judaizing teachers, yes, sir. Uh, basically, those Judaizing teachers claimed that uh, to be saved, you need to accept Christ and the old law. And a lot of emphasis is placed on uh, circumcision, and that's going to be a lot of what we talk about tonight. And the reason why there's such emphasis placed on uh, that act um, is because basically when a uh, Jew converted to uh, I'm sorry, when a Gentile converted uh, to Judaism, they had to obey all the aspects of the old law, including a circumcision. So it was understood that if a Gentile was circumcised, that they would necessarily obey the other, uh, the other um, commandments of the law as well, such as the Sabbath uh, and um, sacrifices and all the things wrapped up in that. And so, basically, uh, Paul, uh, Paul is defending himself against people who are saying that that is required for uh, salvation. And in verses 11 through 24, basically, he kind of breaks it down, uh, the defense of his apostleship, by uh, poking holes in the arguments against, uh, against how authentic his apostleship is. And there is just... Uh, a bunch of different accusations that have been made against him, and there's just a ton of stuff that he has to defend himself against. But like the old saying goes, uh, how do you eat a whole elephant? You do it bite by bite. Uh, and so he, piece by piece, he's picking away at their argument. And in verses uh, 11 through 13, uh, he asserts that his apostleship was just as valid as the 12s, uh, since his gospel was given him directly through revelation. And we made the point last week that just like the 12 apostles uh, had received their apostleship, they had received the gospel directly from Jesus, from the Holy Spirit, so too did Paul receive it from uh, Jesus, from the Holy Spirit. Uh, in verses 13 through 14, he cited uh, basically evidence for his apostleship based on his life prior to conversion. Essentially that he had no reason to leave his ancestral traditions, that he was progressing further, uh, faster than his contemporaries in Judaism and being a Pharisee, and he was on fire for the Lord, and that only a act of intervention would have uh, turned him from the path that he was, that he was so eagerly on. Uh, and uh, in verses 15 through 17, he uh, made an argument with evidence drawn from his conversion. Uh, basically, God had sent, set Paul apart on purpose to deliver the gospel to the Gentiles. And Paul received the gospel, and then he didn't immediately go to Jerusalem and consult with uh, the apostles there and say, what should I do? No, he received the gospel, and then he withdrew to Arabia uh, for years. And uh, basically, his point was that he didn't receive the gospel through man. He received it from the Lord. And he's just making that argument and driving that point home. Uh, and verses 18 through 20, basically, he's making an argument drawn on his first visit to Jerusalem after his conversion. Uh, basically, he went to Jerusalem uh, to become acquainted with Peter. And uh, I make that point to become acquainted with Peter because he didn't go there to learn the gospel from Peter. He didn't uh, go to this older, wiser Christian to uh, be taught the gospel. No, he went to uh, meet his peer. And so uh, he went there and he met uh, Peter and he met James, who was uh, Jesus' brother. And uh, interestingly enough, he is also noted as an apostle. Uh, and basically how, well, uh, Paul was there for 15 days and then essentially got chased out of town by a bunch of Hellenistic Jews uh, because he was uh, boldly proclaiming the word of God. And so basically he just, he had to save his skin and got chased out of town. And the people that he would uh, have been peers with now see him as the enemy. Um, and it, and that, that's not hyperbolic language. He really was the enemy to their way of life because he was saying the old law isn't required anymore. We are uh, justified by faith through belief in, uh, and obedience to Christ Jesus. And that was not accepted, not acceptable by the uh, Hellenistic Jews. And so they chased him out of town because they were looking to kill him. Uh, so that, is, that was his first trip to Jerusalem. And so obviously that it didn't go well. <laughs> so whenever uh, Paul went back to wherever he went, uh, wherever he left from, and the, his, uh, 
his congregation or whoever was there said, hey, how'd your trip to Jerusalem go? He'll, he would say, well, <laughs> not the best. I spent just about two weeks uh, with Peter, and then I got chased out of town. And so uh, basically that's kind of where um, the story picks up here in chapter 2. And again, we'll be reading it um, We'll be reading it verse by verse, but there is a sister account in Acts that we'll read all the way through uh, in just a little bit, but I just kind of want us to uh, make our way there first. All right, so Galatians 2, verse 1, uh, it says, Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus also. So basically, he finishes chapter uh, 1, been telling that story about how he got chased out of Jerusalem. And then he says, cut to 14 years later. After about 14 years, I went back to Jerusalem. So I had to kind of wait for uh, people to not want to kill him. And uh, went back to Jerusalem. And basically, um, he's taking uh, Barnab Barnabas uh, there with him. Uh, now, this is... Um, Barnabas' uh, first mention in Galatians, but he would have been well known uh, to the audience of this letter, to the churches of Galatia. He was a traveling companion with Paul, and so he would have uh, helped set up these churches. And so when he says Barnabas, they know who he's talking about. Um, they also had Titus along with them also, and Titus was a converted Gentile, converted Greek. Um, don't get him confused uh, with Timothy, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Timothy was a half... Uh, he had a parent who was a Jew and a parent who was a Greek. Um, but we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But uh, Titus uh, was a Greek who had been converted to Judaism. Or I'm sorry, converted to Christianity. Uh, so basically, he was being brought along with them to, uh, to Jerusalem. And the reason that he's bringing this up that we'll begin to in just a moment is that Titus is being brought as a test case. Uh, to what's going to be called the Jerusalem Council. And we'll get into that in just a moment also. But basically to determine uh, whether the apostles in Jerusalem would weigh in on whether or not Titus uh, needed to be circumcised to be saved. Uh, so there was a whole lot of um, just discussion whether obviously a circumcision was required. And uh, Paul is saying, you know what, we're going to settle this right now. I'm going to bring someone along with me and either he's going to go back to uh, Judea circumcised or not. Like We're going to put a stake in the ground right here in this council and everyone's going to know about it. And so that's kind of where we're at. And so verse 2, uh, let's read that. It was because of a revelation that I went, that I went up. And I submitted to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. So Paul makes it very clear that he uh, did not go to Jerusalem to be taught the gospel. Once again, he, uh, in fact, he wouldn't even have gone if it wasn't for a revelation from God. It says in the very beginning there, it was because of a revelation that I went up. So obviously um, he had been told, he had been revealed to him that he needed to go to Jerusalem. Um, and uh, basically, um, there's a sister account of this in Acts 15 that I want us to kind of re to read uh, just to get an alternate view of the story. So let's all turn to Acts 15. We're going to be reading um, a, a good chunk here. Acts 15, 1 through 12. All right, so this is the sister account of, of this meeting, uh, what's called the Council at Jerusalem. If your Bible's like mine, it has those little headings. This is the Council uh, at Jerusalem. All right, so 15, verse 1. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So Paul's right there. It's obviously the Judaizing teachers, right? All right, verse 2. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. 
After, they had, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. All the people kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. All right, so when Paul and Barnabas arrived in Jerusalem, they went to the church uh, to preach and basically to settle once and for all whether circumcision was uh, necessary for salvation or not. And again, the meeting of this is called the Council of Jerusalem. And uh, just once again, uh, the reason that this is the crux of the issue, uh, the circumcision keeps getting brought up, is that this is the hinge of uh, what really obeying the law of Moses uh, really rests on, is it's representative of keeping uh, festival days and um, sacrifices and everything that, uh, that Peter called a, a yoke, a, a weight on them that they weren't able to keep and their forefathers weren't able to keep. Uh, all of those things, the, uh, these Judaizing teachers are wanting um, to hang on the necks of the disciples. And so this meeting was to determine, hey, are we all on the same page that, that this is not required? Um, and so, uh, and once again, it's important to note that Paul uh, preached the gospel to the church there, and he wasn't there to be taught. Uh, once again, kind of bolstering his point of uh, that his gospel didn't come from man. Um, so the church there did not challenge what he preached, uh, which lent its validity to Paul's message. And there's an application here that, um, that I just want to point out, that there is one gospel for all. The, the same gospel was used to teach the Jews, obviously a, a traditional, uh, structured, law-oriented group. And obviously every group is, but the Jews more so. Uh, they had their traditions and their laws, and all of it was um, just very rich in their history. So the same gospel for them was the same one for the Gentiles as well, the people uh, who were heathens basically, uh, who worshiped Baal, Zeus, uh, the seasons, whatever. This is the same gospel for all of them. Um, and uh, basically, they couldn't have been more different. But uh, they were all given one word and one hope of salvation. And obviously, that, that reminds me of uh, Ephesians 4. Um, reminds me of Brad's class, actually. Uh, in Ephesians 4, there's one body, one spirit, just as... Uh, just as also you were called in one hope you're calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Basically, there's obviously today, there's so many differences between people. Um, I mean, that, that's apparent. There, there's, uh, there's economic uh, disparities. There's uh, vast cultural differences. Uh, but there is one thing that unites us all. It's the gospel. And there's one gospel message for all. And it's Jesus that unites us all. Uh, anyways, that's a little application that I just wanted to bring our attention to uh, through here. But getting back to Paul and Barnabas and Titus uh, preaching in Jerusalem in verse 2, Paul writes that he preached to those who were of reputation in private. And uh, I believe in verse 9 he calls that out specifically, but um, that's probably uh, James, Jesus' brother, John, uh, the apostle, so John the son of Zebedee, and uh, Peter, also called uh, Cephas. Uh, and these would have been the leading men of that congregation there in uh, Jerusalem. And Paul preaches to them in private to make sure that they weren't going to challenge him on his teaching. Uh, he interestingly notes in verse 2 uh, that he spoke with them for fear that I might, uh, might be running or had run in vain. And what 
Paul is not saying here is he, that he wasn't confident in what he was teaching. Uh, like the Jerusalem leaders had all the answers, and that if they didn't agree with him, then he would have to uh, be subordinate to them and say, oh, okay, all right, you, you have all the answers. Um, he, that's not the fear that he had. Uh, rather, he was concerned that if the Jerusalem leaders had publicly took a stance that for salvation that uh, the law of Moses was required— that all of the hundreds of Gentiles that he had baptized, all those congregations he had set up, would catch wind of that, and then he would have so much work to undo that all of this effort that he had put in would just instantly just be undone uh, because of some false teaching. Um, and that is just a very um, understandable, that would be a fearful thing, because years of work could just be in vain. Um, and it's it's funny, because when I read that, um, this little anecdote, it just reminded me of uh, what my uncle in uh, Japan is kind of facing right now. Uh, some of you all know that uh, I always get asked, are, are you one of those Japan nickels? And the answer is yes. I'm not Japanese, no, but my family uh, has preached in Japan for a long, long time. Uh, my grandpa started preaching there in the 60s, I think, um, and uh, now my uncle, Bob Nichols, is uh, up there right now. Uh, Anyways, uh, my grandpa, and he had converted a lot of people, um, set up a really good church over there, but because of the, um, the Japanese culture, they uh, weren't able, uh, there was not a lot of success with the members there uh, converting their children. Um, and basically, now there's, when Hannah and I visited uh, my uncle there in like five or six years ago, uh, we visited a congregation uh, full of a bunch of older Christians with no younger people. And I was saying, hey, that's, is, that not, is that normal? It's not normal here in America. And, was, and he was like, no. He's like, I have an uphill battle. He was like, uh, all the work that your grandpa put in, it was in vain. And it's something that I was very fearful of. And now I'm having to basically start from scratch. And I'm trying to convert these people's children for, uh, for them or with them. And it's very much an uphill battle that I'm having to start this work from scratch, basically, because it's not a generational thing. Anyways, that just makes me think of this verse here of, oh, I, I've run, I've put in all this effort, and could it be in vain? Um, and not so much... Uh, vanity as in, oh, it was fruitless for me to say this, but you accomplished something, and your accomplishments are about to be undone of where you want to get to. Anyways, <laughs> that's my little anecdote. Uh, any thoughts about verse one, one, and two, one or two before we uh, keep moving on? All right, we'll keep on going. All right, so verse three, real small. Uh, but not even Titus, who is with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Essentially, this verse right here, real small, tells us the outcome of that private conversation with the Jerusalem council, right? Uh, they were all in agreement that one did not need to follow the old law for salvation. Uh, and basically, uh, Titus was not compelled. Like either this verse would have said Titus was compelled to be circumcised, and that would be a completely different thing, or he wasn't. And so obviously he wasn't. Uh, but you may be thinking to yourselves, wait a second, Brayden. Why did Paul defend not circumcising Titus here? Uh, and then in the next chapter in Acts, Acts 16, 1 through 5, he circumcises Timothy. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Let's read that real quick. Uh, Acts 16, verses 1 through 5. Uh, Paul came also to Derby and Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and, and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for all they knew was his father was a Greek. Now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in faith and were increasing in number daily. So why do you think that uh, Paul circumcised Timothy here? Yes, sir. Why did he he was half Jew and that would make his teaching these Jewish people uh, much more easy for them to accept since he was half Jew and he had been circumcised. 
Yes, sir. I, I basically came to the same, um, the same conclusion is that, um, and essentially I kind of asked myself, uh, what is the difference in who Timothy and Titus were preaching to, right? Uh, Titus is preaching, going to, Ju to, Judea, to Judea, that's a hard thing for me to say, uh, to preach to the Gentiles, and Timothy was preaching to the Jews. And essentially the conclusion that I've come to is the same, uh, that Timothy was circumcised to really remove any barrier uh, to hinder those Jews from hearing and obeying the gospel from him. Uh, basically, Timothy was making a concession, obviously, on his part, but he's doing everything that he could do to avoid uh, fruitless arguments that would uh, inhibit the spread of the gospel. And so that, that was more of a, I'm doing this to get out of the way so we're not arguing about it so we can focus on the important things, rather than uh, the case of Titus, who was, uh, okay, it really is this required for salvation. And so uh, any other thoughts on that before we move on? All right. Moving right along. All right. So verse 4. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. So Paul says that the false brethren were secretly brought in. In Acts, they're, they're described as a sect of the Pharisees. Um, I'm sorry, a sect of the Pharisees who had believed in Acts 15.5. Uh, this is to say that they were believers, which is uh, an interesting thing. It's easy to peg these people as the enemy, but obviously these are people who um, believe that uh, Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, for the, for the remission of their sins. And so um, they were believers, and so they weren't, they weren't unbelievers, they were misbelievers. And uh, one application that I think that we can uh, make from this is that you can uh, sincerely uh, believe in the gospel— but be an error because you add or omit something. And uh, think of all the doctrines out there that are practicing an error because they add something, right? It's important not to add or take away from the word. And that's something that, a point that uh, Paul makes in uh, Galatians 1, uh, in verses 8 and 9, right? Uh, no matter who uh, brings you, even an angel brings you a different gospel than what you've heard, let him be accursed. Um, we can't add or take away anything. And your sincerity... If you're practicing um, something that is against the will of God, even though you're very sincere about it, it's going to be uh, in vain if what you're practicing is out of line with the will of God. And that's very counter to today's thinking, right? That's a, that's a very offensive statement for me to say. Um, isn't it a uh, popular culture that if you're sincere about something, then how could that be wrong? How, who are you to tell me that my sincerity is wrong? And, but, but basically, Paul is saying here, it, in the book of Galatians, he's arguing for the purity of the gospel. What he's saying is that how you worship the Lord matters and the doctrine matters. And obviously I'm not saying that doctrine and authority, that that's the only thing that matters. Uh, we need to obey the spirit of the word as well as the uh, letter of the word. What we need to do is love our Lord enough to respect him. And we need to love him enough to obey his word and love him enough um, to uh, basically have respect for his uh, creation, enough to be selfless and to preach the word. We need to have that love, but we also have to do it uh, in a way that's according to how he wants to be worshipped. And that's what Paul is doing here, is he's defending um, the, uh, the purity of the gospel. Uh, but we'll get more into um, that idea of, uh, of love in chapter 5 when we get into the fruit of the Spirit, which I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into. That's a, that's a very rich part of this, um, part of this letter. Uh, basically, Paul writes that the false brethren uh, snuck in, sneaked in. I don't know the right word. My Bible says sneaked, and I read that, and I was like, nah, I, don't, I don't know. That's not right. Um, I'm, I'm very smart. Just kidding. Um, all right. Uh, basically, these people uh, sneaked in to spy out their liberty. And obviously, that's not flattering language. The, I looked it up, and basically, that sneak, uh, that word is basically used uh, in, in correlation with spies and enemies. And to these um, Pharisee believers, Paul and the Gentile brethren were the enemies if they weren't obeying the law of Moses. Um, but what, what was their liberty that we're talking about here in uh, verse 4? They, they were there to sneak out their liberty. What was their liberty? Um, sorry, come again. <laughs> They're free from the old law. 
Yes, sir. And uh, basically, liberty in Christ, um, there's uh, two things that uh, kind of came to my mind, at least when I was preparing this, about the, the liberty that they had in Christ. And the followers could finally uh, receive forgiveness of sins. And uh, I feel like this, especially for the, uh, for the Jew in that day, who had generations upon generations of their sins being pushed back one year, right? And uh, they had to make sacrifices every year for their sins to be pushed back again and again and throughout generations. This is liberty from that. This is freedom from the weight of their sins. They could finally actual have forgiveness of their sins. And that must have really struck home with those uh, first century Jewish believers. Uh, and they also, they could have access to God without obeying the Mosaic law. And uh, to me, I feel like that would be a thing that really struck uh, the Gentile believer, where it's like, okay, um, I'm not going to be a proselyte who uh, obeys the Mosaic law and have to be circumcised and have my family circumcised and, ob and obey all of these uh, tradition and uh, lofty things that I have to obey. I have uh, the word of God now. I have access to the Lord uh, through faith and belief in Christ Jesus. That is the liberty that we have. We have the freedom um, that we don't have the yoke of the old law on us that um, when Peter said that... Uh, that the Jews and their fathers going back generations weren't able to keep. And so we have liberty from that. And Paul says in verse 4 that the reason the false teachers were spying out their liberty was to bring them back into bondage, or bring them into bondage. And obviously I don't think that means literally I put them into prison. Rather, I think that means uh, spiritual bondage, uh, arguing that they had to submit to the Mosaic Law. All right, moving on. I think I probably need to hurry up because I have a few more pages and a few more minutes. All right. <laughs> um, in uh, verse 5, But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. The them that Paul is referring to in this verse uh, is a subject of the previous sentence, the false teachers. He didn't succumb to their demands that Titus ought to be circumcised to be saved. Uh, so that the truth of the gospel should remain with you. Basically, Paul's motive uh, for not submitting to their demands wasn't so that he could win an argument, right? It was not out of selfish pride, but to preserve the purity of the gospel. Another application here is that's the same thing that we should be doing too, right? Um, we need to, uh, just like Paul, stand up for the purity of the gospel. And that also, by necessity, means that we need to know what the purity of the gospel is, right? We need to uh, be in... Uh, the word. We need to know our gospels well. We need to know what Jesus said and uh, what he expects of us. And uh, let's see. Um, yeah, there's churches today that uh, don't want to be unpopular, so they make concessions all the time uh, that kind of, inf that, not kind of, that, that infringe on, uh, on the purity of the gospel. And so we have to be aware of, uh, of what it says. And and basically, not just hear what people say and take it at face value and apply it to our lives. We also need to read it, right? That's why I'm asking you to open up your Bibles and read with me and study with me instead of just sitting there with your Bibles closed and hearing and accepting everything I tell you. That We want to critically examine this together so that we can give a defense if we need to. Um, all right. We're going to move on quickly here. All right. Verse uh, 6. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. All right, so Paul throws out um, a uh, parenthetical into the statement, which Paul is obviously known to do, but basically we'll quickly tackle uh, the main sentence and then the parenthetical real quick. Um, basically, the main sentence of what he's saying there is, those who were, were of high reputation contributed nothing to me. Uh, so the pil pillars of that church, um, James, brother of Christ, uh, John, and... Peter, uh, basically, they didn't add anything to what he said. They took what, he, uh, what Paul preached, and they agreed with him. Uh, now, the parenthetical, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. That's a statement that he's making about James, John, and Peter. And what I believe he's getting at when he says what they were is he's answering an argument made by the Judaizers, that they were claiming that the authority of James was superior to Paul because he was Jesus' brother. Uh, they were claiming that the authority of John and Peter were superior to Paul uh, because they journeyed with Jesus. And Paul is saying that that makes no difference to him. 
their past association with Jesus did not negate the fact that he received the gospel directly through revelation and that his authority as an apostle was just as valid as theirs. And the end of this par par parenthetical, he says, God shows no partiality. And uh, this is added to show that Paul is not depreciating the apostles in Jerusalem, simply saying that there's no difference uh, between their authority and his. Uh, however, this is one of those cases that you can take something out of context in the Bible and it still is perfectly valid. God shows no partiality uh, between people, that he's not a respecter of persons, which we'll get into uh, more in a few classes. We'll actually jump, uh, we'll get re real into that. All right, so wrapping up here in this section, verses 7 through 10, let's read that together. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was also eager to do. So this is another instance where Paul is inserting a parenthetical into a statement that when you kind of, when you do like your casual uh, Bible reading, it's really easy to read Paul's letters uh, and get kind of mixed up. It's like, all right, where, where did this sentence begin? So sometimes it's good to just focus on like, okay, what was the main point? And then go back, okay, what was that? Uh, what do you say in parentheses there? And so we'll uh, do that real quick here is kind of go into the sentence and then the parenthetical. So what he's saying here is that James, Peter, and John saw and approved of his work that uh, Paul and Barnabas were doing among the Gentiles and extended the right hand of fellowship, right? Um, interesting to note what Paul says in verse 9, and recognizing the grace that had been giving to, given to me. This is referring to uh, Paul as an apostle. God gave Paul to Paul the same apostleship and authority that he did to Peter. And now think about where uh, Peter and Paul were uh, 15, 20 years prior to this. Uh, Peter was traveling with uh, Jesus uh, and saying, uh, Lord, let, no, don't wash my feet. I'll, let me wash your feet. Like having that attitude. And Paul, who was actively looking to persecute followers of the way and what grace had been given to him that he might be on the same, uh, the same authority level as uh, Peter. It, it's that's basically something that just emphasizes the, the grace and the mercy of our Lord. Um, and oh, I just have a note here in, uh, that grace is an undeserved favor, which certainly is uh, very just emphasized with Paul. Um, and so basically the right hand of fellowship there, uh, just saying that, that they approved of what Paul taught and that they saw him as their peer. And this mostly wraps up Paul's defense of his apostleship. Uh, the Judaizers had gained traction because of what they had spread about, um, about what the uh, apostles in Jerusalem had believed as far as uh, being circumcised or not. They said, oh, no, no, those, uh, those apostles in Jerusalem, they agree with us that you need the Mosaic law. And Paul went up there and basically he shook their hand and said, no, we're all on the same page here that that's not required. And that, that was a devastating blow to the Judaizers who were basically trying to put a wedge in between the apostles, uh, like the 12 and uh, Paul and Barnabas. And so any argument that the Judaizers had against the authenticity of uh, Paul's apostleship and the purity of the gospel that he was bringing to them was properly debunked. Um, all right, so ending this section, verse 10, Paul notes that they asked him to remember the poor, the very thing he was eager to do. When he says remember the poor, he's referring to uh, raising funds to care for the poor among the saints in Judea. And uh, basically, if you remember um, joining Christianity, especially if you were a Gentile or a Jew, if you joined Christianity, basically you have to just remember back in this uh, uh, ancient Near Eastern world, your religion and your family and your trade, all that was wrapped into one thing. So when you believed in Christ and you left Judaism or you left uh, following Zeus or whoever, basically you were turning your uh, back on ancestors. And uh, if, you have, if there's someone in your house or of your family that uh, wasn't on the same page with you, that, um, that disagreed or whatever, uh, let's say that you're a farmer, all of a sudden you've lost um, 
you've lost rights to that farm that your family's had for generations or whatever the family trade was. And so notably, in the first century, there was going to be a lot of poor Christians because they gave up everything to follow the way. And so uh, this verse just for me emphasizes that there were uh, plenty of brethren who needed to be taken care of. All right. And then our final thoughts here tonight, uh, basically takeaways from the section is that there is one gospel for all mankind. And if a gospel, if one gospel could be followed by the first century Jews and uh, the heathens, those uh, sinners, the Gentiles, if they could follow one gospel, then we all can follow one gospel as well. And the gospel message is uniform. Uh, people today like to uh, pit the four gospel accounts against, uh, against the words that Paul records in the Bible. We made the point last night uh, that, um, that uh, then-presidential candidate uh, Barack Obama had made some points that, uh, that Paul's view or his um, message on homosexu homosexuality was in uh, conflict with and inferior to the Sermon on the Mount and the Golden Rule, uh, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. And basically, if you see um, that as uh, those Paul's words and the Gospels in conflict, or you see Paul's words as inferior to um, the Gospels, then you're going to have a very different view on the New Testament. And uh, basically, my point here is that the Gospel message is uniform. And uh, they're, they're all inspired, all necessary for our understanding of uh, and our of our understanding and our salvation and growth as Christians. Uh, so that's all that I had this evening. I'll lead us in a closing prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Dear Lord, we come to you now at the end of uh, this worship.